So a last little note of housekeeping. Following the talk that I'm about to introduce to you, there'll be an opportunity to ask our speaker questions. And the way we try and do this, especially when there's a larger group of listeners, is to ask you to submit your questions during the talk using the chat function. I will then collate submitted questions and put them to Dr. Nelson on your behalf following his presentation. Okay, so far all the housekeeping. Now I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker. Dr. Howard Nelson has been a fellow of Lucy Cavendish College since October 2019, and he's been a great asset to the college from day one. Howard is a Trinidadian wildlife biologist and forester with 33 years of conservation experience in the Caribbean. His roles in Car Caribbean conservation include being the CEO of the A.S. Isa Wright Nature Center, a lecturer at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine, and a policy specialist on wildlife, forests, and protected areas for Trinidad and Tobago's Ministry of Environment. In this university, Dr. Nelson is the Fauna and Flora International Lecturer in Conservation Leadership. And he and his students here and in Trinidad and Tobago work on diverse conservation issues in the Caribbean. I'm not going to say anything more. I'm just going to hand over to you. Oh, thank you so much for that, uh, Henriette. It's so good uh, and so kind of you that uh, to provide that introduction. I wanted to start off by saying a big thank uh, thank you to uh, Ella Barrett and the development team at Lucy for today's invitation to speak, um, to share my thoughts on, on uh, Caribbean bird conservation with everyone. Um, I, of course, wanted to use this as an opportunity to share as many of my Caribbean bird photos as possible with you all. Um, and so to start off from, from left to right here, I've got the Cuban Amazon parrot, the Guadalupe woodpecker, and the Martinique oriole. And these are three species that are unique to the Caribbean. So um, I guess one, one question folks might have is, you know, why am I uh, uniquely qualified to tell this story about bird conservation in the Caribbean? I think, um, uh, as Henriette indicated, I, I was born in the Caribbean and I've been fortunate enough to have a long career. I've spent the last uh, 30 some odd years um, working as a biologist, um, but also working in several networks. Uh, uh, with many groups working on conservation of birds and their habitats in the region, including uh, a former role as the president of Birds Caribbean, the largest uh, bird conservation NGO in the region, and as a, uh, currently as chairman of the board of the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. And um, as Henry had indicated, Asa Wright, which is um, turned out the biggest uh, conservation NGO that owns the land in the country. And I'll talk some more about those kinds of things. Um, and I've been fortunate enough um, as an academic to work on distribution of endemic, endemic birds, look, um, to look at climate change and climate change's impact on these species. Um, I've been uh, lucky to, to work on protected area design and sustainable use of wildlife in the region. Um, and through each one of these roles, I've had the opportunity to reflect on the complexity of bird conservation in the region. And I wanted to try and share, you know, some of the beauty of the birds, but also to share the story of the challenges that are facing them. So here's my plan for our time together. I firstly wanted to convince you that uh, Caribbean birds are worthy of consideration. <laughs> so we'll see how, how successful I am with that. Um, and then I want to shift gears and, and explore um, a little bit of a relationship between local people in the Caribbean and their birds. And then finally, uh, through the last part of my talk, I want to try and share some insights of, um, of the challenges that I see facing the conservation of these species uh, in the region. Before we move on, I have to include some more um, exotic bird photos. So, um, of course, I'm going to start off with the scarlet ibis um, here on the right, uh, which is 
the National Bird of Trinidad and Tobago and the Greater Flamingo, uh, which is regularly seen in the Northern Caribbean, but also in the, in the Southern Caribbean as an occasional vagrant. Um, so let's talk about the, the islands and uh, what makes them so, so interesting. Well, I want to suggest that there are a few characteristics that make them worthy of attention. The islands of the Caribbean are really tiny in terms of their land area. They barely make up one half of 1% of the area of the globe. But in terms of their uh, biodiversity, uh, the islands are really remarkable. When you look at birds, uh, there are at least 738 species that have been recorded from the islands. Um, and, and so, so having this list, they account for um, about 8% of global bird diversity. Some species like these here are widespread among the islands. So going anti-clockwise from the top, I've got a banana quit, uh, the magnificent frigate bird, a tricolored heron, and gray kingbird. The sheer richness of species alone is a compelling reason to be interested in birds um, in this region and their conservation. But the closer you look, the more interesting the birds of the region become. So um, as a biologist, one of those traits that we tend to be interested in um, is called endemism. And when a biologist uses that term, what we really mean, um, what we're referring to is the uniqueness of a species to a given place, whether or not it's only found in that, um, in, at that given location. Among the Caribbean's birds, a little over 170 species are only found in one or perhaps a few of the islands that are in this archipelago. Here are a few of these endemics. Uh, so going from, uh, from the top right clockwise, we've got the Trinidad piping guan. This is one of the world's most endangered crassids. Now the crassidae are a group of birds that kind of look like turkeys and they're native to the new world. At the bottom right, we've got uh, a couple of iterates. These are, um, start with the Montserrat Oriole and next to it, the Jamaican Oriole. And then finally on the left, I've got for you the Jamaican Red-billed Streamer Tail Hummingbird. Uh, these species are interesting because they're restricted to single islands and are what biologists like to call uh, single island endemics. In fact, over 100 species of uh, the endemic birds that are in the region are restricted to just a single Caribbean island. However, it's not just the species, individual species that are unique. Among Caribbean birds, entire families are unique. Um, and depending on uh, the taxonomist that you speak to, which uh, classification system you want to use, there's anywhere from two to five whole families of birds that are unique to the Caribbean region. For instance, to the left, I provided a photograph of what is called the Cuban toady. And the one to the right is the Jamaican toady. These birds belong to a family that are only known from the Caribbean islands. And the five species in this family are limited just to the greater Antilles. So Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico. Now, unfortunately for me, I have not been to Hispaniola and I don't have photos of the um, Puerto Rican toady either. So unfortunately, these are the only toadies you're gonna see uh, from me today. Uh, perhaps they might form part of my next trip back to the Caribbean if I get, it, get back there anytime soon. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about that really makes these Caribbean birds interesting is rarity and specialization. Here I mean the specialization to use specific kinds of habitats or utilization of specific kinds of resources. One of the classic cases of interesting coevolution is the adaptation between hummingbirds and the plants that they pollinate. Two good examples in the Caribbean islands are the purple-throated carib hummingbird, which I've provided a photo of here to the top right, and the rufous-breasted hermit hummingbird to the bottom of your screen. Both of these hummingbirds are specialized to pollinate a group of plants called heliconias. These heliconias are a kind of understory forest plant. Um, now, as a matter of course, since islands often have limited geographic area, those birds that tend to be adapted 
the specialized kinds of habitats or use specialized resources are of course going to be limited in terms of the number of individuals that can persist on each one of these islands. Here, of course, such specialization can get these species into trouble. So on the bottom left, uh, I've included a photo of the critically endangered granated dove, which today is thought to number just about 110 mature individuals. This species is uh, thought to prefer dry forests in Grenada. Um, and the, the issue here for this species is that this dry forest not only occupies about 7%, um, of the island of Grenada. Now to put that in perspective for you, 7% is about 2,100 hectares on Grenada. And uh, for those of us that are based in Cambridge, I guess um, to put that in, in, uh, um, in an image that we can really relate to, uh, that uh, 2,100 hectares is only half the size of the city of Cambridge. So, this is um, a, that's really limited to a really tiny area. Now, historically, these uh, Caribbean islands have been the centers of extinctions, with some of the highest rates of historical extinction recorded. So for example, the region has lost 55% of its original parrots. We believe that this amounts to the loss of about 14 or 15 individual species of parrots parakeets and macaws, mostly since the arrival of Columbus in the 1400s. We know that many of the islands had their own parrot or macaw species that are now lost. I've included images of three here, such as this Martinique Amazon on the left, in the middle is the Puerto Rico, um, Puerto Rico parrot, and the, the one on the right is the Lesser Antillean macaw. These birds are thought to um, have been hunted to extinction for food and for feathers. With the uniqueness and the uh, comparative rarity of these Caribbean birds, perhaps the greatest challenge for any of us who work in the Caribbean bird conservation field today is the sheer number and complexity of the threats that these species face. These threats include Caribbean, sorry, include human-derived pollution, habitat loss, uh, introduced species or invasive species, uh, hunting, and climate change. Uh, given the sheer magnitude of the threat to biodiversity globally today, one approach to uh, prioritize uh, conservation action uh, is to focus efforts on areas of the globe that have been identified as biodiversity hotspots. Such biodiversity hotspots are places that have a lot of um, unique species and are under threat. The Caribbean is one such biodiversity hotspot and is actually predicted to have among the highest extinction rates for endemic species of all 36 biodiversity hotspots identified globally. This is in part due to habitat loss and climate change. Unfortunately for us, these threats don't function in isolation species can face several or all of these threats at the same time. And many of these threats can act synergistically, meaning that their joint impact is greater than if they acted singly. Today, invasive species, habitat loss, and overexploitation are the greatest threats in the Caribbean, uh, with uh, climate change quickly um, ramping up in terms of its uh, degree of threat. Now, as an example, um, the near-threatened Barbuda warbler is on the top right of your screen. This, this bird is only found on the tiny 62 square mile island of Barbuda. And so it does have a naturally small population size to begin with. In 2017, the category five hurricane Irma devastated the island with a direct hit. I think perhaps many people would remember the pictures in the news. The first team of surveyors uh, who went to the island a couple of weeks after the storm found only eight birds on the island. Luckily, a year and a half afterwards, a second survey team found that the, the bird um, was appearing to, to recover. But what this illustrates is just how vulnerable these small populations are to extreme weather events. And even though many, many island species are actually quite resilient to storms and have evolved in the presence of hurricanes, uh, 
many of them will struggle to cope with the increasing intensity and high return rate that we're predicting uh, under future climate change scenarios. Further increasing the complexity of conservation of this, uh, this species is the unique cooperative land ownership system in the island of Barbuda. Since the hurricane, the national government has been seeking to privatize uh, much of the land on the island, which would pave the way for international hotel development. So far, this hasn't happened, and the local population is largely against it, but it raises the complexity of land ownership and socioeconomic challenges of achieving sustainable development and biodiversity conservation on these small islands. As a collective second example of what conservation biologists call proximate threats to the birds, remaining parrots on the islands face pressure uh, for capture as local pets, as in the case of this Cuban parrot um, that I've provided in the uh, middle of your screen, um, or um, they face the threat of illegal international wildlife trade, as in the case of many of the remaining parrots on the Windward Islands. For example, the St. Vincent parrot that I've uh, provided a photo of here on the right. Finally, uh, in islands such as Trinidad, the pet trade has already led to the virtual extirpation of finches, such as the sporophylla seed eater on your left. Um, and these birds now are only known on the island as cage birds, which have been smuggled in from Venezuela. So what's the scale of this threat? Today, one quarter of the endemic birds in the, in the region are threatened with extinction. To put this in perspective, by comparison, the rate of threat for birds globally is about 13%. What's more, for those endemics that we have population trend data, uh, what we're seeing is that about 60% are thought to have populations that are in decline. Here, the threat of extinction uh, could lead to the loss of genera that are unique to this region. Um, examples of these unique uh, families include the spindalises uh, found mainer, mainly in the Greater Antilles and that I've represented here in a a photo of the Western Spindalis, which is found in the Cayman Islands up to the southern um, tip of Florida. I've uh, put for you also the Cuban trogon here in the center, which is one of two species of the uh, genus Priotellus. And finally, at the bottom left is the Zapata sparrow, which is the, a single species from the genus Toriornis, which is only found in a few locations in Cuba. These are some of the unique species threatened by these five proximate threats of habitat loss, overexploitation, alien invasive species, pollution, and climate change. Clearly, changing land use is a major threat to endemic birds. When considering the Caribbean context, most landscapes are already greatly modified or impacted by humans in some way. Indeed, over 95% of the land area in the Caribbean could be considered to be human modified. Another factor uh, is the proportion of natural forest that's left. Today, it's estimated that the Caribbean hotspot has less than 30% forest cover remaining across the region. Of course, a unique feature of the islands is their small land area, which of course then leads to tensions between conserving land for biodiversity and the reality of these being actually working landscapes. We know that land use change remains the biggest cause of biodiversity loss globally, but again, climate change is rapidly um, accelerating to become the next biggest threat. And this is true in the Caribbean, where these threats combine to pose perhaps one of the greatest threats to biodiversity. Additionally, this challenge um, of uh, biodiversity loss um, what we're seeing is uh, the threat of loss of the habitat in those areas that are already protected. That is places that have already been decided by these national governments in the Caribbean that they should be protected areas. Thus, although it's hard to quantify the degree of habitat loss across these protected areas in the region, perhaps an example might give us some indication of the nature of the challenge. So I'll use the example of Trinidad, where we were recently involved in the development of their new protected areas systems plan. We estimate 
that on um, that using the available remote sensing for the country at the time, so about two or three years ago, uh, that 60% of the existing protected areas had already lost 10% or more of their forest from deforestation. Now, mind you, this, these are areas that are already officially protected. But the birds are important to Caribbean people. They are a re repeating motif in the imagery of the islands and icons of the culture of the country. Whether it is flamingos and the coat of arms of the Bahamas, the St. Lucia parrots on the shield of that country, the green-throated Carib hummingbird on the Eastern Caribbean banknotes, these birds have found a place at the center of daily commerce and in the national identity. These species are also repeatedly used in storytelling across the region. For example, the use of this uh, Trinidad Pipinguan or, or the Pawi, as it's known in Trinidad, in children's storybooks, or as motifs in art, pants, and costume, as in the example here in the carnival costumes of Trinidad. Birds are a central part of the imagery of the Caribbean. If we look at economic activity on the island, tourism, is more important to the Caribbean countries than any other region, contributing directly and indirectly approximately 32% of GDP. Here, ecotourism accounts for nearly 5% of this, um, of this total, and much of this is generated by bird watching. With at least 2 million people involved in the tourism sector, either directly or indirectly in the Caribbean, birds and bird tourism provide an important livelihood for many local people in rural communities, as well as provide a key resource um, or a key uh, financial source for management of uh, natural areas. Birds also provide a diversity of ecosystem services to Caribbean people beyond that as tourist attractions. They maintain ecosystem function through a, diversity, a diverse array of functions, including pollination, which we've seen already in hummingbirds, uh, to see this dispersal, as in the case of this red-bellied um, macaw from Trinidad, featured in the top right, feeding on palm fruit uh, in one of the island's natural savannas. Birds are still at the center of recreation and subsistence hunting on the islands, with species such as ducks and migratory shorebirds still widely hunted, and regional migrants such as this white-crowned pigeon uh, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, still regularly taken by sport hunters. This traditional use of uh, birds for sport and food uh, represents another critical challenge as the intersection of the loss of habitat of these species, the impact of alien invasive species, and other anthropogenic pressures make the sustainable harvesting of these birds more and more difficult. In the long run, whether such traditional consumptive uses of these birds can be maintained is an open question. The threats that I discussed earlier are what biologists call proximate threats, those factors that cause the immediate decline of a species. But what of the ultimate human threats, those factors that are the root cause of these proximate threats? The key challenge of conserving these species in human-dominated landscapes and addressing these ultimate threats is really complicated. In most countries in the Caribbean, uh, most of them are considered middle or lower income countries and are challenged by a lack of knowledge about the birds, about their habitats, and the options for managing them to ensure that they persist on the landscape. These countries also have limited financial and human resource capacity uh, with which to manage these species and their ecological systems, and often uh, have weaknesses is in legislation and enforcement that's needed to protect these species. In the next few slides, I want to explore these ultimate threats to the Caribbean birds in a bit more detail and share some of the lessons that we've got so far. Now, the Caribbean consists of uh, 30 nations and territories, each with their own unique culture, heritage, and this diversity makes the place an amazing place to work. But it also means there's great complexity working across the region's states and territories to ensure that uh, you have conservation of the birds and their habitats. An important challenge uh, facing bird conservation today is the management of the remaining natural areas. It is one of the biggest challenges 
facing Caribbean birds due to the small size of the islands and the pressure for land, not only for nature, but land for housing, land for agriculture, and other kinds of human activities. Balancing these needs is now one of the most challenging aspects of bird conservation, um, especially given the threat of climate change. Uh, and oftentimes the, the fate of these natural areas is constantly being challenged. And what I wanted to do is uh, tell the story um, of uh, the Grenada dove that I introduced earlier in this talk. So this is a species we've worked on with a colleague of ours, Bonnie Rusk in Grenada. Uh, and in that country, even though it is the national bird, it's currently restricted to two small areas on the island and numbers barely uh, 110 mature individuals. One of the main threats to the dove is habitat loss from development for housing, tourism, and agriculture. The dove is only found in lowland dry forests, um, which is where the pressure for development is greatest because it's flat, close to the coast, and dry forest is perceived as having very little value. One of the key areas for the dove is called Mount Hartman. Um, and it, this area was actually designated a protected area in 1997. But as an example of the fragility of depending on protected areas for conserving these species, this park was degazetted in 2006. And degazettement basically means that the government re removed the legal protection for the site. Um, and this was done to allow a hotel development, which then luckily fell through due to an economic crisis at the time. Since then, there have been multiple attempts to develop the area and it's now facing threat of a new development just outside the park boundary. The tragedy here is that even though these developments have not so far amounted to much, it's, it's not been before large areas of the dry forest have been cleared. And this story is being played out again and again across many remaining natural areas and landscapes in the Caribbean. Another challenge for Caribbean bird conservation is finding support uh, for work to address conservation of these threatened endemic species. In the graph on this slide, we show the result of a review of published scientific literature on Caribbean endemic birds. Specifically, we found that most of the bird families have much less research effort than you would expect based on the number of species that are within each family. A notable exception are the parrots, and this reflects the large number of studies on these charismatic and threatened species. Of course, this doesn't mean that we should do less research on parrots, but it does provide us with an indication um, of where we might want to focus more effort in the future, such as those more evolutionarily unique species or on species that are currently of least concern for which we know very little, but many of which we, we now think are already in decline. Not only do we lack support for studying these specific species, such as this common Antilli lesser, lesser Antillian bullfinch that I've pictured here, which is from Grenada, one of the key gaps is in long-term monitoring of these species, long-term monitoring of their habitats and of the microclimates where they occur. Now, this kind of routine work is often not novel enough to get published in scientific journals or projectable. What I mean by that is um, being able to write a short-term project to do long-term mon monitoring is very difficult. And as a result, this, um, this particular gap is very difficult to fund. But nonetheless, it's this very data that we need to be able to understand the impact of uh, alien invasives, habitat loss, and climate change on these species. Now, climate change presents us in the Caribbean with um, many challenges to the birds. Not only does it mean a rise in ambient temperature, but it increases the risk of drought, forest fire, and shifting the limits to where the different forest types can persist. Importantly, it presents a change in tempo and of intensity of hurricanes and storms. And in doing so, this change in particular greatly increases what biologists call calls stochastic risk. Um, basically what we mean by that is unpredictable risk of extinction. Uh, in a sign that this risk is already materializing, just recently, the Bahamian warbler was uplisted um, in terms of its uh, degree of threat 
This uplisting was in part due to the recent threat posed by Hurricane Dorian and the anticipated increase of future risk um, posed by hurricanes to this species. This is perhaps the first sign that our risk assessment for all Caribbean birds needs to be reassessed uh, due to the increased storm severity and frequency. It also means that we need to start thinking about how we respond to hurricanes after uh, um, one of these storms has impacted a bird and its habitat. For many of the birds in the Caribbean, a key issue is the potential response of their habitat to climate change. Now, one such such response might be that conditions of rainfall and temperature and disturbance might force the forest that they depend on to shift over time across the landscape. This represents a serious challenge given the small size of the habitats and existing patterns of land ownership and land use. For example, we've already detected a serious challenge of this type for dry forest in Grenada, where we've done modeling which indicates that this forest type may start shifting upland uh, and having profound impact on birds, farmers, and for the existing protected area boundaries. In addition to all of these changes is the great uncertainty of our predictions for the future uh, because our current climate models for the region are, remain very coarse. A word on externalities and the shock uh, in bird conservation. COVID-19 has been a significant challenge to the conservation action around the world, particularly for local conservation efforts. The outbreak of the pandemic has meant a major economic shock in conservation, particularly for those uh, conservation efforts which rely on international ecotourists to fund their conservation action. A good example of this in the Caribbean is uh, Trinidad and Tobago and the story of the Acerite Nature Center. It is one of the longest standing conservation NGOs in the country, and it's the country's single largest private landowner with the most land explicitly designated for conservation of birds and their habitats. For 54 years, the Nature Center has been amongst the most successful ecotourism sites in the country, but after one year of COVID, the Nature Center has formally decided to close its ecotourism facility uh, in a move which currently looks to be permanent. Here, the lesson is that reliance on a single form of sustainable income does not guarantee the persistence of conservation action that targets birds and their habitats. Of course, it's more than just uh, resilient organizations that are required for conservation of Caribbean birds, but people are central to successful bird conservation action in the Caribbean. This brings us to another key challenge in the Caribbean, that of human capacity. Among the uh, amateur and NGO or ontological community, there's a growing body of trained professionals, which we think can translate into filling these knowledge gaps. While it is true that cap capacity among NGOs is largely increasing, this, however, is not reflected in many of the national agencies with the mandate to manage these species and their habitats. From this perspective, we often find that capacity is one person deep, meaning but often there's a single individual that works in multiple areas of con conservation in government agencies. By comparison, in a more developed country, such as the UK, these roles would be undertaken by a room full of people. The story of Grenada um, and the photo that I've provided here is one in which um, I was meeting with uh, the permanent secretary and the staff sitting here are probably 80% of the staff of the forest department. Um, and so the story of Grenada is one um, in which the, the Forest and National Parks Department has seen a slow and steady decline in personnel since we started working there uh, more than a decade ago. A cohort of trained senior foresters have retired. And in 2014, the government initiated an attrition policy in order to, to pay back loans from the International Monetary Fund. This has meant that only one person is hired across the civil service for every three retirements. The lack of funds also means that junior foresters haven't received the training that was provided to their senior colleagues. We've seen that this lead to despondency within the agency. What this means for conservation is that there's a mismatch between the coverage of protected areas and the actual capacity to match these areas. But there is some, some positive side of this limited human resource. 
working in multiple fields forces individuals to look beyond single issues and to take a broad interdisciplinary view of the conservation challenges facing the island. This is a huge strength in the region's conservation professionals and it's reflected in the solutions that we see uh, for many of the region's conservation problems. Um, this lack of knowledge and human capacity reflects some of the resource and political challenges in the island and the importance of political will to conservation. Protected areas are considered the crown jewels in conservation globally. This is because we know that protecting whole habitat is more effective than single species or ex situ conservation approaches. However, as we've seen in Grenada, protected areas are vulnerable to degazetting and downgrading. In Trinidad and Tobago, the protected area system has been in place unchanged since the 1960s, apart from some minor tweaks in the early 2000s. We've known that this system is inadequate since since the early 1970s, as it doesn't provide the best coverage and representation to ensure resiliency of the natural systems on the island. Despite three major attempts to revise this system, the country was unable to undertake the changes to its protected areas that would enable it to keep up with current best practice. All the attempts at revising the system were thwarted by a lack of political will, uh, with multiple governments failing to push forward the plans due to apathy or a lack of urgency. In countries like Trinidad and Tobago, there are still many areas that could be protected. For example, we know that there are several ecosystems that are underprotected, but their protection requires buy-in by multiple stakeholders, even where the land is owned by the state. After 40 years of trying, we finally made a breakthrough as part of a large global environment facility funded project aimed at improving protected area management in the country, we wrote a new protected area systems plan. And in 2019, the government of Trinidad and Tobago agreed to go forward with that plan. So what were the lessons from this? We learned that timing is everything. It took 40 years because we needed not only to have money in place for the project, but we needed to have the right persons delivering the message. And the right persons in NGOs and government agencies and the wider civil society to receive the message. Also, there's been some more good news. Um, as of October 2020, UNESCO also announced a new biosphere reserve in northeastern Tobago, which is now the largest man in biosphere reserve uh, in the English speaking Caribbean. And it encompasses the Main Ridge Forest Reserve, which is also the oldest protected area in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it was established in 1776. Um, this brings us to the last challenge I wanted to highlight, and it's one that's central to conservation on the island, the problem of conserving birds in the remaining limited geographic land space that's outside of protected areas. This means that conservation in the Caribbean presents a compromise uh, between striving for formal habitat protection and the reality of working landscapes. To put this in perspective, uh, current international targets for the Convention on Biological Diversity, known as the Aichi targets, call for 17% of global terrestrial area to be um, designated as protected by 2020. Actually, the Caribbean is doing a pretty good job in that on average about 19% of the terrestrial areas there were protected. Although this varies widely between territories and as you've seen in Trinidad and Tobago, there are often gaps in that protection. But amongst the international community, there's a growing call to protect even larger amounts of land when the Aichi target is renegotiated. This was meant to happen last year, but COVID has meant the delay of this uh, process till later on this year, 2021. But this figure we present here uh, in this slide highlights the challenge of increasing protected areas in the Caribbean. It's clear that in some countries, even achieving a target of 17% is not possible using formal protected areas, given the small proportion of state lands. Noting that these state lands include all types of land use, not just forest. Uh, there are calls to increase globally the targets for protected areas anywhere between 30 to 50% by 2030. But it's clear that achieving this uh, only using state lands in the Caribbean is unrealistic for many islands. But if we can't expand our formal protected areas to provide sufficient coverage for these endemic birds because of the limits of state lands, what else can we do? 
This is especially important given the threat of climate change, which means that we need to, need to consider the ability of our protected areas to support species under future conditions, as the ranges of these of many of these species and their habitats might shift, for, for example, to higher elevations. Whatever new protected area target is decided, we still need to consider that more than 80% or so of lands that fall outside of uh, formal protection. We've seen the challenge of maintaining protected areas in Grenada and trans um, and so ensuring uh, climate resilient landscapes and managing these species um, for which we know very little, um, it's to be a real challenge and will require a whole landscape approach. Uh, what's a really positive step in the right direction is that half of all Caribbean National Biodiversity Action Plans, these are plans that um, countries are required to uh, to create uh, under the Convention on Biological Diversity, identify the management of private lands as a priority for biodiversity. They are real. Uh, they represent a real opportunity to incentivize uh, private conservation, and we found that there was real support for this among stakeholders during during our own uh, protected area consultations in Tobago. Some ways uh, to develop these public-private partnerships that are still underutilized in the Caribbean include using defense for ecosystem services or agri-environmental partnerships. What is central to the success of promoting such approaches um, at a broad scale is having strong leadership and governance that is committed to making these approaches economically viable. At the same time, such a landscape approach presents us with what ecologists term with problems, as they represent an intersection of factors involving public perception, values, economic and poly policy incentives, and then the biology of these natural systems. Solving these land use questions in a way that meets human needs and aspirations, as well as ensuring persistence of these birds and their habitats and the landscapes re represents a truly wicked problem. But governance alone won't lead to successful buy-in by stakeholders. Uh, uh, those endemic bird conservation programs that have been successful to date in the Caribbean are deeply rooted in the cultural importance of the birds. They engage stakeholders by recognizing and drawing on local narratives about the birds and their habitats, and they place the action of local communities at the center of efforts to protect and restore the birds. One early model of this was a program called the Rare Pride Program, uh, which uh, focused on some of the endemic parrots in the region. And through the Pride Program, Rare were able to engage local communities by using marketing methods in a way that wasn't done before in conservation to connect the birds um, and people and highlight their value um, to the uh, collective national heritage. Now, there are many other local success stories today that work across the spectrum of protected areas and private lands. Many of these are supported by an organization we work closely with, which is Birds Caribbean. I've had highlighted just a few of these success stories in this slide from the control of alien invasive species in Antigua and offshore islands, community uh, management and planning in Jamaica, community education in Hispaniola, and the Caribbean Birding Trail, um, as well as the Endemic Bird Festival. These projects use locally appropriate interventions that work to the benefit of all those who share the landscape. They are truly successful because they have strong leadership. They are truly participatory and they engage local decision makers. And they've got um, investments in long-term partnerships and they integrate local knowledge in management practice. They demonstrate that even with small investments, we can have big positive impacts for the conservation of endemic birds as well as their habitats and the communities that live alongside them. So what are my final lessons? Uh, I'd say that uh, the Caribbean presents a, a complex uh, challenge to the conservation of its nat native birds. Um, we recognize that increasing formal protection of land and habitats around the islands is becoming increasingly unrealistic but that the Caribbean has an opportunity to lead the way to reconceptualize how we achieve landscape scale conservation. The persistence of the diverse array of birds in what is already heavily impacted human landscapes on these islands suggests that there are local land sharing and land sparing solutions that can be learned from and amplified to improve the status of these birds. Successive local community projects to improve management of these species 
demonstrates an opportunity to promote a sense of ownership um, of the Caribbean cultural and natural heritage, as well as conserve the suite of endemic species necessary for maintaining ecosystem function. Uh, finally, we hope that there is a silver, silver lining of the COVID pandemic. Um, perhaps it provides us with an opportunity for the Caribbean conservation community to reflect on its relationships with nature and build the capacity necessary to adapt to a changing environment. Um, I wanted to end by Lucy for the opportunity to share my thoughts on bird conservation in the Caribbean. And I also wanted to um, uh, really single out here my colleagues from the Forest Department of the Government of Grenada, the Environment Policy and Planning Division of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago, the FAO's uh, Caribbean sub-office, and my partner Ellie, who works at the University of Edinburgh, as well as all our colleagues at Birds Caribbean for their continuing support. Thanks very much for that, and I'll take any questions now. Okay, thanks, Howard. I'm sure that I speak on behalf of everyone if I say that that was a beautiful presentation and some really beautiful pictures as well. So we've much enjoyed not just the talk, but also the visuals. Thanks very much. Um, during the talk, a number of questions have come in. And the first one is from Martin who says, um, how committed are the various Caribbean governments to conservation and restoring biodiversity? And you've said some things about that already, but maybe you could elaborate a bit more. Well, it's hard to generalize across the Caribbean, given that there's so many territories there. And you know, politically, they're all really different. You've got um, islands that are um, part of the European Union. I'm thinking in terms of uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique, um, are, um, countries that are that remain um, British protectorates, British territories. I'm thinking of uh, islands like Montserrat, for instance. Um, and then you've got the independent territories that are um, the Spanish-speaking territories, uh, Cuba and um, uh, the Dominican Republic, and then the English, 13 English-speaking territories, and they're all so different. And I guess that I say all that to say that it's difficult to generalize. I think a lot of Caribbean uh, technocrats recognize that um, you know the, the countries rely on their um, biological diversity, including their birds, for uh, um, sustainable livelihoods. But getting that at the top of the political agenda can be really difficult, and it really depends um, on you know the financial state of the country, the, the strength of the local um, NGO sector, um, and you know how. Um, how much pressure there is from outside. A lot of countries uh, experience a lot of uh, external pressure um, from uh, uh, bilateral funders um, for conservation of their, um, their, their habitats. So it, it really depends. It, it can be really var variable. And I don't want to uh, single out any country um, unless I don't get to go back. <laughs> okay. Um Maybe a related question to that um, by um, Andrew Dobson um, is with so many countries and territories within the Caribbean, is any effort made by government ministers or environmental officers to meet and discuss the common problems, um, especially with regards to birds? So are these different regions trying to talk to each other and identify how they can um, help? Yeah, definitely. I think you know, across the Caribbean, there, there is um, something called the CARICOM, which is the uh, Caribbean uh, community. Um, many of the islands in the region are members of the CARICOM. And there is a, um, a meeting of the environment ministers that uh, used to happen fairly regularly. Um, and that used to be the forum with, it, with which the, um, the Caribbean environment ministers and their agencies used to um, used to meet and discuss these issues. And now, um, in uh, be completely transparent, um, Andrew Dobson was also um, president of Birds Caribbean. Uh, um, okay. Andrew, I'm giving a nod to you as well, and um, just to say that there are. Um, vehicles to answer your question. There are vehicles for that discourse. But my experience 
working in the region is actually there is a lot of strength in the communication that takes place between the mid-level technocrats, the folks that work at the ministries of planning, the ministries of environment, the forest departments. Um, there's a lot of communication between them through um, regional meetings like the ones that we have at Birds Caribbean, through uh, meetings of the regional foresters that um, used to happen again every year they used to happen. Um, I think um, those things, some of those things have changed. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, Birds Caribbean, we used to have meetings every year. Now we have meetings um, biannually. Uh, but there are vehicles for this. However, at the political level, it can be very challenging. Um, and the main vehicle has always been that meeting of Caribbean ministers and environment. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, let me see. I have another question that's coming in um, saying, sorry to hear that Asa Ride Center is closed. I think there should be an international support or survival fund internationally in such cases of the pandemic and other disasters. Maybe this can be based at the IUCN. Is there such a discussion um, on this in um, on a international? Yeah, I, but that's, that's a great, uh, great idea. Um, I've not been privy to any discussion on something like that, but I think that that would be a great idea. And certainly, um, again, for, for those of us that, that work in the Caribbean, and I think all the folks who are asking questions are actually people who've, who've worked in and who, um, who know each other in the Caribbean. Um, but certainly, I think um, the, the, the root of this question about um, developing systematic response uh, to these uh, threats, such as the pandemic or um, maybe a climate disaster, uh, we need to plan these things better. And I think we need to respond um, as, a, as a global community better. Uh, and definitely, I think that it should be something that, that uh, you know, perhaps IUCN could do to help coordinate that, that action at a global level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Andrew actually had another question um, asking you if you've seen any nuthatches in, <laughs> in the Bahamas since well, Hurricane Dorian. Probably not, not in person, Dorian. but... <laughs> yeah. Not since Dorian. I, um, I haven't seen any since Dorian. Um, uh, the last time that uh, we were there in, um, in the Bahamas was 2011 was the last time I'd seen, seen a nuthatch. So um, it's very worrying and uh, Andrew asks a good question because um, a lot of these birds, um, you know, a lot of these birds, they're really on the edge and all they need is a really bad, slow hurricane. And why, the reason I say slow is that we're starting to see that, um, you know, there's some, as they, these hurricanes get larger, they seem to stall over some of the islands and sit over them for much longer than they would have historically. And uh, we're seeing that this, this is adding another dimension of threat for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I'm just checking, but I think I'm at the end of uh, the questions that were there. So I'm just going to sneak in a question myself. Um, so you talked about uh, how um, a lot of the islands have tourism and that the tourism involves bird watching. Mm -hmm. so how do you feel about that? Beca um, mm. it, because my guess is that the number of tourists can also be a threat to yeah. Yeah. Um, the birds that are there. So how do you deal with that? that? That's, a, that's a really good question, Henriette. I, I think, um, so for instance, uh, when I worked at the Ace Right Nature Center, I'll tell you this, I share this insight with you, that we'd always say that um, uh, heads in beds is more important than the tourists that would turn up on a cruise ship, for, for example. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people like, like cruises, but the truth is, is that the um, amount of uh, financial resources that, that uh, for instance, uh, cruises bring to the islands is tiny compared to those people who actually come and stay on the islands because um, they then uh, bring, bring in and spend more money in, um, in the islands. Obviously. Yeah. Um, so it depends on the kind of tourism. And of course, the issue, um, and there's lots of papers on this already um, about um, carrying capacity in these areas. 
um, where you've got ecotourism actually taking place. Um, and of course, there is no free ride. There's always going to be some disturbance if you take people into an area where there's going to be birds. Um, mm -hmm. And really, it becomes a question of how threatened are the birds at the site? Are there are they species that are easily disturbed? Um, you know, have you really thought about you know um, alien species at the site, etc.? So, so it really can be site specific. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know the, the role of tourism, as we've seen in the case of ACRI Nature Center, doesn't necessarily guarantee um, long-term sustainability or viability of uh, you know conservation action. So uh, I think it, it's a mixed bag, um, and I think it really depends on the site and the species involved and um, the other options that are available. Because if there are no other options, then you may not have a choice. Um, mm. um, unless you can find a way to pay for ecosystem services, for instance. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it can be a, a challenging one to work out and it really depends on the site. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just checking if there's any other questions. I cannot see any others in the chat at the moment. I see lots of thank yous. Um, ah, there's one coming in. Oh yeah, no, another thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So I think um, we're very close to seven o'clock, so we're running out of time anyway. So I will take this point to say once again, thanks very much, Howard, for a really interesting talk um, with lovely visuals. And um, I'm sure that all of us wish you the very best in your work. And we want those birds conserved as much as possible. So. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for hosting, uh, Henriette. Really great to see you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.